Um, so yes, thank you very much uh, for, for having me here to speak. Uh, my name is Tom Harbour. I work for the Association of Commonwealth Universities based here in London. Uh, and I'm going to give you a really quick uh, run through of the DRASA program. And that is Development uh, Research Uptake in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, now, research uptake, we do get a lot of questions about the term itself, so I might clarify that before I start and then can move through. Uh, if we just think about it as uh, getting research out of the universities and into the community, uh, into government, into enterprise, uh, into, into the community generally. And as you can see from our, our cunning title there, it's development research that we're focusing on, and development research specifically in sub-Saharan Africa. So, uh, this is basically what I'm going to run through. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to move through the first three or four sections uh, quite quickly. I'm aware of time constraints, and then I can hopefully get a bit more uh, in-depth about the different phases of the project, some of the actual things we've been doing on the ground when we've been with the universities. Uh, and then we can have some questions. So, uh, why Drasa? Why would anyone fund it? Why would anyone participate? Why would we do it? Uh, there is a demand for evidence-based research to stimulate sustainable development. Uh, as I was saying, it's uh, within governments, there's a demand. Uh, within private enterprise, there's a demand for this research. There's also a demand within uh, NGOs for development research as well to support what, what they're trying to achieve. Uh, and the reason for the demand uh, what underlies it is uh, an assumption, and I, I hope that many will join me in thinking it's quite a strong assumption, that uh, quality evidence can contribute to better outcomes in agriculture, health, education, government, and climate change. Now, because we focus on development research, they're the ones we chose to name, but I hope that you uh, agree with me that uh, quality evidence contributes to better outcomes in a whole range of disciplines there. So uh, this evidence, this quality evidence, is being produced at the moment within uh, our partner universities. But we're trying to, within the DRASA program, facilitate getting this uh, evidence to the right people, the decision makers, the people who can pick it up and implement it. So um, applying and using evidence is currently constrained by limited access to research information. And we looked at that. Briefly, I think in the last section, where we were looking at libraries, getting research and information, even just outside the libraries into other areas of the university. So if we, if we even take a step back from there and try and get the information from outside the university to the wider community, it's, uh, it's difficult as well. Uh, another impediment is uh, weak interactions between policy makers and research communities. Now these do exist. Uh, we find that Uptake does exist, of course, at the moment, without our help, shock. But uh, it's serendipitous, usually. And in many cases where the interactions are strong, they're based on personal uh, relationships between a researcher mm -hmm. and someone, say, in government or in, uh, in a commercial enterprise. It could have been someone they studied with. Uh, we find alumni uh, networks uh, are particularly strong and a good, a good mechanism for getting research uptake. Uh, and why did our partners uh, get involved in this? Well, universities can play a stronger part in providing research evidence uh, and to be involved in this discourse, particularly we're thinking uh, policy and government discourse, but it's not restricted to that. What is DRASA? Uh, it's a five-year uh, five DFID funded program led by the Association of Commonwealth Universities. Uh, we operate uh, in conjunction with uh, two delivery partners. One is the Centre for Research on Evaluation, Science and Technology, or CREST, at the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. Uh, and we also operate with uh, Organisation Systems Design, or OSD. They're also based in South Africa, and they help us with our online platforms and our networking uh, between our partner organisations. And of course, the, uh, the most important partners are the 24 universities who are part of our network from across sub-Saharan Africa. And here they are. Now, I know we've got some uh, representatives from some of these uh, universities. I think there's a University of Makerere representative here, and there's a University of Ghana as well. I think I saw. 
Yes? Hello. <laughs> um, so yes, these are all the universities here. As you can see, there's, uh, they're, they're quite diverse. Uh, I can. Uh, I have some uh, stories of good practice and uh, some of the challenges related to each of the universities that they're confronting. I think a, an interesting and a useful point brought up by one of the earlier uh, presenters was the issue of contexts. There are multiple contexts. So there's overlap between some of these universities in what they're trying to achieve and how they're trying to achieve it. And there are some vast differences as well. So Now, what specifically is Drasser trying to achieve? Now, I, I wasn't involved in... Uh, drafting this sentence, but I think it's, uh, it was uh, a challenge issued to us to try and get it into one sentence, what exactly we do. So we, we went for a really big sentence. <laughs> so uh, essentially, if we can break it down to, to make it a bit more manageable, we're trying to get improved capacity in each of our 24 universities to contribute research evidence for pro-poor policy and practice. So that's uh, when we start to look at phase one in a moment, that's where we've been focusing uh, our efforts thus far. Uh, the second part uh, of what we're trying to achieve is increased appreciation, understanding and demand for university produced development research evidence. Uh, and this is, this is equally important and it's something we're going to start to look at in phase two of the project when we work a bit more closely with uh, government agencies and try to get them to talk more with our universities. How are we trying to achieve this? Okay, we have uh, an organi organizational change program which operates at three basic levels. We have individual skills and knowledge development, which uh, we run largely in partnership with CREST, and we have uh, individual scholarships and bursaries available to members of staff and academics from our universities. Uh, strengthening organizational processes and systems. That's largely what the ACU uh, will be looking at through its benchmarking procedures and also through some of our workshops that we hold with the universities. And sharing learning and engaging with research uptake discourse. This is where our online facility comes in, where we work closely with our, with our partners in South Africa. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about each of those a bit more as we go on. Uh, our approach is to facilitate universities uh, reviewing their own current processes and systems uh, to support universities develop standards in managing research uptake, which as you can see I've put benchmarking in there, that does come back to uh, one of the ACU's major roles in this, in this uh, program. Uh, to build up knowledge through PhD, MPhil, short course workshops for staff involved in research uptake activities and they're all done through uh, CREST at the University of Stellenbosch. But uh, because uh, of our partner organisations are all over Sub-Saharan Africa, they're not all based there. So their, their lecturers are able to come out and de deliver the course materials in different regional areas. And we've tried to isolate some hubs that are easy for people to get to. And uh, finally, fostering uh, an active community with learning partnerships across the 24 universities. Now, what you'll notice there is the, the language at the beginning of each of those points. We've got facilitate, support, fostering, build up. <clears throat> this is very much uh, a program where we try to get the 24 universities to identify their own strengths and weaknesses, where they want to develop, where they want to progress, uh, and then they tell us and we help them to, uh, to move in that direction by isolating. Uh, issues and points of good practice that are occurring elsewhere in the world that they may want to tweak, change a little bit, or embrace wholeheartedly as it is. Okay, in the current phase, which has recently ended, so last month it ended with our symposium. Uh, okay, at the beginning of uh, this phase was bringing all the 24 universities together for a process benchmarking uh, procedure. And that was in Johannesburg. And we brought together representatives from all the universities to discuss uh, challenges and strengths in the area of research uptake, and also their opportunities and threats. And uh, over, over a two-day conference, uh, the, uh, the partners all came together and agreed upon these 50 statements of good practice 
for uh, research uptake. These are points uh, that are actually very specific. Um, we've divided them up into four themes and they address different activities within the university. So there are a whole range, for instance, related to uh, the use of libraries and librarians and how they're involved in the research uptake management system. Uh, now, once, once those had been developed, they were distributed to all the, the university representatives who went back to their, their representative campuses. And the follow-up procedure uh, that, that we have in practice with, with this project is for uh, the DRUSA team to go to each of the universities uh, and meet with the representatives there uh, to, to follow up on the, on the statements of good practice and to see uh, whatever other support we can, we can offer in terms of research uptake. So our workshops usually look at helping the universities to identify their internal and external stakeholders for research uptake management, who's producing the research internally, who wants it externally, how can these people meet, how can we get them to communicate better. Uh, so that's, uh, and it's also helping look at uh, policies and practices as well. So um, as part of the selection procedure for our universities, we, we tried to select universities that were moving in this direction already. Uh, a number of the universities were actively at the time looking to redraft their research policies. And we're, we're hoping to encourage these universities and take too much encouragement to include research uptake elements within these, uh, these new research policies or the redrafting of them. Uh, so that's at, a, that's at a more macro level in each of the institutions. Uh, an individual level, the, the program offers PhD, MPhil and short course bursaries for, for our members. Uh, and we found these uh, are very useful and do feed back into the institutions themselves. We've, uh, uh, we've recognised a number of the universities that we've, we've since uh, visited who have had representatives complete these courses and come back and feed that learning into the drafting process for new research policies. So that's been, that's been very positive. Uh, in terms of our own learning in how research uptake uh, can be best affected within the different regions and the different contexts, uh, we're following four long-term case studies uh, from selected from our universities. Uh, we have one from CPUT in South Africa, one from Ibadan, and just confirm my notes, one from Mauritius, and one from Umbarara. So they're all on uh, a range of different uh, scientific advances. The one from South Africa is looking at nanotechnology and five minutes already. Okay, <laughs> I shall move quicker. Um, Yes, so there's, there are some case studies there that we're, we're looking to learn from ourselves and feed that learning back to our partner universities. Uh, and program communication, we have a DRUSA website, we also have a DRUSA blog site where uh, we have uh, a closed community where uh, we have 600 members from the partner universities and also the partner organisations who can uh, feed into uh, their own learning and good practice from their own university. So we find once we've, we've finished a workshop, uh, say at the, uh, the University of Botswana, the head of research there could ask a question, oh, this, this is an interesting point that came out of the DRUSA uh, meeting. Uh, have any of the other DRUSA universities come across this? We're thinking about doing X, Y and Z to address it. Has anyone done something similar and found something else. So, and we get feedback on that a lot and it's the university starts to talk to each other a lot more, which is very encouraging and something that didn't really happen much before, before the program. Certainly this, this medium has helped. Uh, and finally, at the end of uh, phase one, it's just uh, recently been completed, was a learning symposium hosted in Nairobi, where we got one representative from each of the 24 universities in to uh, feed back on what they've learned since the benchmarking and since the, uh, the, the planning workshops were delivered and where they're planning to move from there. So it was, it was very encouraging. Everyone did attend, all 24, which we were slightly worried about. And uh, we, we did survive the troubles in Nairobi, but it was, uh, it was definitely well worth it. We've got a lot of learning that's come out of that. Uh, and it's quite heartening to note also that each of the universities as part of that symposium produced 
uh, a draft strategy for where they plan to go for the next three years in developing research uptake in their own institution. So um, that's very promising and something we hope to build on in, in the following phase. Uh, feedback on the individual universities. Uh, something that I, I wanted to mention uh, that came out of the, the symposium uh, in current strengths was the unity of purpose and the, the willingness to communicate <laughs> with, with other universities. Uh, to, to, to be frank and to say, look, we're, we're struggling with this area. Is there anyone who's, who's doing well in this area? And we're, we're happy to report that uh, it's, it's no longer just a series of bilateral relationships in, in Drossa where each of the 24 universities looks to the central partners for, for answers. The universities are starting to look to each other and, and rely on each other and help each other. And I think that's, that's very positive for a sustainable approach to the program itself, hopefully once long past since we've gone, that they'll continue to uh, communicate with each other in this way. The challenges, of course, are, are many-fold. Uh, the different contexts, of course, is, is one that will come up. Uh, we have the 24 universities from 12 different countries. Uh, each of the different countries uh, have their own different approaches and, and uh, unique issues associated with them. Uh, something that came up just uh, since the... Uh, the project has started is uh, Rwanda's plan to merge 17 of its higher education institutions. So we, we happily had two Rwandan universities. We, it looks like we're going to end up with one. But um, that's, that's actually, we're taking that as a positive because we'll have twice the number of uh, engaged uh, and interested people in Drasa in this new institution ready to, uh, to, to kickstart research uptake, hopefully in earnest there. Uh, this is, I know I've only got one minute, so I'll move quite quickly through this. <laughs> I've, I've lifted this from uh, uh, an Australian government source where um, they've, they've been looking at uh, research uptake management as a practice. So one of the challenges, the major challenges we face when we, we come to a university and say, look, here's, here's some of the practices you can look at with research uptake, engaging more with alumni, uh, engaging more with your libraries. Uh, it's, it's to try and get away from the perception that research uptake is a final add-on once you've completed the research, that it's something else you just have to do. All right, I've done my research, I've done my publication, that's it. No, you've got to go and do something else. Uh, this, this diagram uh, is, is an attempt to illustrate that it's, it's a number of incremental things along the way that can really, really help out. And <clears throat> Excuse me, and increase the uh, the potential for research uptake. So I might skip over it quickly. We can come back to any questions. <laughs> we, we're going to ignore that one for the moment because it takes far too much explanation. That's uh, one of our university CPUTs uh, approach to their research uptake. So we we'll skip over that one. Uh, phase two. What are we doing in the future? Uh, our primary focus uh, is to support universities develop a program for change. So out of the symposium came their draft uh, proposals for change. We're going to help them develop those. Uh, they developed them initially in consultation with all the other universities and with us at feedback at the symposium. Now comes uh, another more challenging bit is to go back to their own universities and uh, try and get it embraced by uh, the senior management. But, but we're optimistic. Uh, we're, uh, and the reason we're optimistic is we're aligning the program's activities to support and focus these areas. So where in the first phase our workshops were really catch-all, very generic for all of the universities. We've now got a bit of data on all the universities. We've got an indication from the symposium of what they want to focus on and where they want to go. We're ready to tailor uh, workshops specifically for the for the needs of the individual universities. Uh, one of those things that they've asked for is more practical training and training of trainers within the universities. So there's sustainability involved at the universities. Uh, the sharing of learning, so that's, uh, we're looking at maybe some changes to our online platform to make it more easy. Uh, one of the, the issues that we found was that some of the representatives from the universities, particularly junior, 
uh, particularly junior representatives, were reticent to put a comment up with their name under it and their association. So, uh, particularly when you know their boss and their boss's boss was looking at it and saying, "Well, I don't agree with that." But so that's one of the issues. So we're looking at making it a bit more maybe anonymous and facilitating uh, feedback there. Uh, and I'm getting the nod here. So I'll, I'll, one final thing I want to bring in is that we're looking to bridge the gap between supply and demand. So where in the first phase we've been working very closely with the universities themselves, individual academics uh, and librarians of course, uh, we're now working more with some government agencies to see how they source their research, how they look to digest their research, so policy briefing papers as opposed to journal articles, uh, and, and how that, that gets into policy briefs and policies in the end. And I won't trouble you with all of these. These are some of the ideas that we've generated from the, from the universities themselves specific to areas, and they relate to our um, good practice guide. So I will leave you there. Thank you.